Well, I'm astounded at the number of people here. I kind of figured I'd be here mumbling to myself, but uh, at least there's somebody who's going to be uh, listening to me. Um, recently read a Forbes magazine article that said all roads lead to natural gas uh, as a transportation fuel. <coughs> so um, I felt that uh, all biofuel pathways uh, lead through pretreatment. Uh, that's at least true as far as liquid fuels are concerned. It's very expensive to make ethanol and uh, break down legocellulosic substrate to the sugars and then create fuels <coughs> without uh, some sort of pretreatment. Enzymes are expensive. Uh, also, uh, pretreatment has been used to, uh, for uh, animal feed improvement. In the 1930s, a German scientist developed ammonia treatment. It's commonly practiced throughout the world uh, where you inject ammonia onto grass straw and substantially increase the uh, efficiency of uh, the rumen. A uh, breakdown of, uh, of lignocellulosic materials. Unfortunately, it's not pa uh, practiced in anaerobic digestion, <coughs> but it can uh, cons considerably improve anaerobic digestion. Anaerobic digestion typically only reduces 50% of the uh, substrate uh, to gas and uh, maybe do better at a longer solids retention time, but at reasonable detention times of 20 days, that's about the best you're going to do. That results in substantial quantities of uh, of uh, undigested material that uh, can be used as uh, bedding material. A lot of it can't be used for uh, much other than composting it, which is uh, another waste of energy. There's been a lot of articles written on, on uh, biomethane potential as a function of, uh, of the uh, substrate uh, characteristics. Uh, this is one of the latest ones that was recently published in Environmental Science Technology. It had R-squared values uh, up uh, exceeding uh, 0.9. Uh, the the important point is, is that there are certain substrates that result in the production of less significant quantities of uh, uh, methane gas, and there's other substrates such as uh, characteristics such as lignin and crystalline cellulose that do not break down easily. Lignin doesn't break down at all in an anaerobic reactor, uh, crystalline cellulose will uh, break down uh, slowly. <coughs> There's a lot of, been a lot of pretreatment technologies being developed, mechanical devices, uh, solvent fractionation, chemical dilute acids is the, is the uh, preferential uh, uh, pretreatment technology uh, today. Um, steam explosion is a preferred technology for uh, softwoods. Um, and there's ammonia fiber explosion, which uh, uh, actually uh, is not extensively utilized, but it has uh, some of the best characteristics. So what's important that in, as far as pretreatment is concerned, uh, the conversion effectiveness is, uh, is the primary uh, uh, consideration. Processing time is also important. Um, dilution, how much, how much water do you have to add to the, to the process? Uh, uh, and that's when we increase the downstream reactors, uh, the size of them, the amount of energy pr uh, used. Uh, chemicals used, the loading, and whether you can recover those chemicals or not. In most cases, you can't. Uh, downstream impacts, a lot of the pretreatment technologies, such as steam explosion and the rest of it, have, create inhibitory uh, products which inhibit uh, the downstream uh, conversion of the sugars to, uh, to uh, uh, alcohol and other fuels. <coughs> We became interested in the ammonia fiber explosion process uh, some time ago. Yeah, the effectiveness of the process is, is, is the best. It's, it's a glucose conversion of 96%. Processing time is the lowest, five minutes. Dilution, it doesn't dilute the material at all. Um, and the energy consumption is one of the lowest temperatures of operating, but uh, it requires high pressures, which uh, is, a, is a big cost. Chemical use is at the highest loading rate and it has also the highest recovery cost. has no downstream impacts and uh, the operation and maintenance costs and the capital costs are comparable to dilute acid. This is a diagram of the uh, ammonia fiber explosion process. You can see it's a complex process and, and it uses 12% uh, of the energy value of the of the uh, you know, substrate <coughs> is used just in, in the pretreatment process itself. We developed the ammonia bicarbonate fiber explosion process uh, when we we're dealing with ammonium bicarbonate that we would recover from the anaerobic digestate. And we were playing around with it, and we found that we thought that it could be used effectively as a pretreatment uh, uh, technique. Uh, it's everything that the a a a AFUX process isn't. It's a very simple process, operates at low temperatures, um, low pressure inputs, 
we use the ammonia, the ammonium bicarbonate to create the pressure. It has a very low loading rate and it has a, 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 a low recovery cost. Basically, we're using ammonium bicarbonate, which is composed of three gases, ammonia, H2O, a, and CO2, uh, that when cooled, create ammonium bicarbonate, and the inverse is true, when heated, it breaks down into those gases. So if you add ammonium bicarbonate to a substrate, heat it up, you're going to create a lot of pressure uh, uh, in, in, in within a reactor. This is a cartoon of the, of, the, of the process. Basically, it consists of a pump that you feed the, the influent biomass in and uh, add the ammonium bicarbonate to it at some desired ratio. You don't really need the pump. You know, we're kind of looking at the uh, prototype uh, reactor as being uh, that we just put the whole roll of bill of straw into the, uh, into the reactor and, 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 and treat that. So what, you put that in the reactor, close the valves, uh, isolate it, heat it up. Uh, you can use microwaves. Originally, we thought we'd use microwaves, but in a pilot facility, we used uh, shell heating because it was less expensive. And uh, now we're back to looking at gas heating. So it builds up the pressure. You, you release the uh, pressure within the reactor. It gives, uh, goes through an explosion reaction that, uh, as far as the internal uh, luminal cellulosic material is concerned, the vapor goes into a separate reactor that's cooler, reforms your ammonium bicarbonate, which you recirculate. We looked at uh, treating manure solids uh, direct off a of screw press uh, in, a, in, a, in a dairy and grass silage from the same dairy. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a slide of the, uh, dried materials. You can see the manure solids uh, uh, is uh, finer chopped after it's passed through the room. What we did was we uh, took the, um, we had uh, five reactors. Uh, each one of the reactors, we would put different quantities of ammonium bicarbonate in, different ratios of solid to uh, ABC. Um, and the final reactor, we didn't add any ammonium bicarbonate. Just, it was just heat treatment. This is the picture of the, of the pressure reactors. We measured the temperature on the outside, temperature on the inside, as well as the pressure that occurred. And as, as, <coughs> as we heated up the reactor, uh, the reactor was, became pressurized. And uh, this was a pressure time curve uh, up to 60 degrees C. Uh, and uh, the upper curve has the highest uh, 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 ammonium bicarbonate. And of course, the lowest, the heat only, there's no bicarbonate. This is a, a pressure temperature curve. Uh, and basically, this curve uh, follows the the, the, the curve that you would expect from uh, uh, the boiling point of ammonia. Uh, what, what, it, what it actually happens at the low temperatures we're operating at, we don't vaporize any of the water. Uh, we, in fact, don't vaporize the ammonia because it's not boiling. And the pressure is created by the CO2. We designed a pressure reactor to take well over 1,000 PSI because we thought all three would be working. And, and they did when we microwaved it. But, uh, and in the, our tests, only the CO2 created the, the pressure within the reactor. When we released the pressure in the reactor, it went to uh, these large Tedlar bags, and the ammonium bicarbonate condensed on the surface of the Tedlar bags, but it also condensed in all of our piping and clogged it up. And um, so we ended up having to uh, heat trace the, the piping uh, to the, uh, the Tedlar bag. Uh, we analyzed the gas bags, which re what remained in the gas in the bags, and the bags didn't completely de uh, deflate because there was CO2 in them, and we could, because we lost some of the ammonia and uh, water in the reactors, and uh, which was a problem because we weren't getting a, a, a effect of the downstream digester, and it also uh, affected re the recovery. We took, we slurred uh, the uh, products of the pretreatment. Uh, we had 10 react digesters uh, that were uh, fed and had a common uh, heat bath. We measured the, the uh, at a mass flow meters on each uh, digester. We measured the methane gas uh, yield. We also measured the composition of the gas daily. We had uh, five silage di digesters, uh, four manure digesters. They operated at a 12.5 day hydraulic retention time. And uh, we kind of, kind of pushed it, but uh, we wanted to heavily load the, the, the digesters. 
This is uh, what happened as far as the ammonia nitrogen characteristics. Uh, the more highly loaded digester over time um, developed a significant ammonia concentration that was inhibitory. If we were able to recover the ammonia from the reactors, we wouldn't have that effect. The lower loaded digesters uh, uh, were reasonable ammonia concentrations. Of course, the ones that the reactor that didn't receive any uh, uh, ammonium bicarbonate had the uh, lowest ammonia concentration. Similar cases uh, uh, well, took place as far as the pHs of the, uh, of the um, digesters were concerned. In fact, the, the digester that was, um, didn't receive any pretreatment uh, um, actually was uh, operating in a slightly acidic uh, acid phase because of the heavy loading. The reactors that had the um, highest ammonium bicarbonate pretreatment also had the highest methane concentrations. And the reactor that wasn't uh, pretreated had the, the lowest methane concentrations. The manure solids, uh, the so quantities con converted to gas were significantly different. Uh, the higher, higher loading inhibited reactors uh, only uh, you know, retained 51.1% uh, conversion to gas. The untreated uh, uh, achieved 47% uh, conversion to gas, and the uh, moderately uh, treated or Mount dose of ammonium bicarbonate that wasn't inhibited uh, uh, achieved the um, highest conversion to gas of uh, 66.7. Overall, as far as the manure solids are concerned, we got a 34% increase in volatile solids conversion to gas with the pretreatment as opposed to non pretreatment. We didn't do the same as far as the silage is concerned. I don't have the silage information here, but uh, the silage we got 14 to 16 percent, about half of what we got the monies, uh, of the manure solids. And the reason we believe that that, that occurred is because the, uh, the silage had a certain amount of, uh, of uh, crystalline cellulose in it, and we, our pretreatment process allowed the breakdown of that crystalline cellulose. And that crystalline cellulose, after passing through the rumen, the crystalline cellulose is twice as much, and consequently the pretreatment results in the breakdown of that, and we ended up uh, getting more gas. It was interesting to compare the technologies, uh, the ammonia straw treatments that have been used, and you know, a lot of this, a lot of these uh, information is uh, comes from China, where they use ammonium bicarbonate uh, for pretreatment of straw, and they also use ammonia as well as urea. So um, we we achieved a 14 to 49 percent uh, increase in yield, and the straw treatments is uh, 11 to 14 percent. Bad thing about straw is it takes a long period of time, months. And you also have no way of reclaiming the ammonia. It goes up in the atmosphere and out. And the idea is to use the ammonia, reclaim it, and, and not have any impacts. <coughs> well, the lessons that we learned is that the straw is a poor conductor of heat. It's commonly used for insulation. It took a long time to heat up those reactors. It should have been a couple of minutes. It ended up being a couple of hours. Um, so it had long heating times. Uh, loss of ammonia in water was a real problem, and the clogging of the pipelines was a problem. Um, we've basically developed a, a different approach to it, where we have a, a reactor that we heat to 68 degrees C. Um, we uh, use a gas recirculation system where we circulate gas, we heat the gas up, and we circulate that, and gas transfer to the straw or a reasonably dry substrate uh, is, uh, is uh, pretty easy, and even though it's compacted in there, and we can heat it up. And then after we reach up temperature, temperature uh, we switch the, the two valves, uh, these, these valves, and uh, we circulate it back in, and we condense the ammonium bicarbonate in the uh, cooler reactor, and then we cover it. And that's uh, it. I hope I made it in time. Uh, we have but, questions. Yeah. Any questions? So it's dry material that you put in this reactor. If you started with a slurry, what would happen? You'd, put, you'd have difficulty doing a slurry. We put it, we took silage and it was wet, silage is wet, and we, uh, we looked at all the different, we, we dried it and fed different concentrations. It, it it's, works more effectively the drier the material is. But you can do, we, we ran, we were running a process that had uh, a 40% moisture in it. Dennis, did you do any um, energy balance in terms of the, you showed the incremental energy yield, 
Um, how did that compare percentage-wise to the input energy to the process itself? Uh, we didn't do that analysis, but I can tell you that the input to the process was essentially negligible. In, in this, in the final version of the process, you know, your input is a heat. And that, that heat doesn't go, go to waste because you're heating up the substrate, you're pasteurizing it at 60 degrees C. You're also putting enough heat into that substrate to be able to heat your digester. So whatever heat you're adding to it, and that's about all you're adding. You have a, in the final uh, process, you have a recirculating fan. But that fan doesn't have to recover, overcome any high pressures because it's in operating the, the pressure on the suction side is the same as the pressure on the discharge side. The discharge side is slightly more enough head to get through the to the uh, uh, to the saw substrate. But our, our energy requirements are minimal. Conveying the substrate into the chambers and stuff like that. That's going to vary from installation to insulation. But we visualize it the way this is going to work is you're going to end up with a reactor that you end up dumping in your material, whether it be whole straw bales or you know, it could be rice straw, it could be wheat straw or whatever. You just drop those into the reactor, close it up, heat it up, release the pressure, and you know, it pre-treats it. And you can, your, your yield of, uh, can be significantly greater. <clears throat> this, this process is also actionable to uh, ethanol you know, production as well as uh, biogas production. Um, but if you have a pump, then that's going to depend on the, on the solids. Now they, they make the make these uh, uh, progressive cavity pumps that can pump corn cobs. And uh, so the, the uh, what you're pumping is going to influence whatever it is. But we didn't do that analysis.